Hear me? This yeah. is real fancy. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Please send me all this stuff. I'm not tech savvy at all. So, um, can you guys hear me? Man, this is cool. All right, awesome. So, first thing, um, I'm an introvert. I was just talking to someone else who's a super introvert. So, I'm going to act like I'm not, but really I am. So, let's just all keep that in mind, okay? So, my name is Tanisha Spencer. It was Epps. I just got married in August, so I have to get used to saying that. Thank you again, Jim, and your lovely wife for a picture frame that they gave me that I got to put a picture in my house. So, our present today's presentation today is midterm rentals, which I actually don't like the term midterm rental, and I'll tell you why here shortly, but um, MTR Mastery is my Facebook group, I think, and also my YouTube page, so that's why it says MTR Mastery. This is actually a house that I own, so we'll talk about that one as well. If you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Today I'm going to talk a lot about ways to get into deals, um, what is a midterm rental, who your clients will be, how do you cater to them and then choose properties that actually fit what they're looking for. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to ask. Um, but please, like Philip said, raise your hand so he can bring you the mic. So again, my name is Tanisha Spencer. Um, I have 20 plus years in the insurance industry. I used to be a corporate traveler, so I traveled around the country for free on someone else's dime, which was wonderful. Um, helping families that were um, having insurance claims. So I used to be a, an adjuster, a manager. I dealt with an entire total loss department uh, for the entire country for a major insurance company. Um, and I used to live in corporate housing. So I lived in hotels and I also lived in corporate apartments, which is actually how I ended up choosing uh, this lane instead of being a wholesaler. No offense to wholesalers, but I was afraid to get on the phone and talk to people, so that's probably not a good use of my time. And we just talked about this. So um, I am a licensed realtor, licensed in quotations, because I do have a license, but I don't actually know how to be a realtor. So maybe one day I'll learn. Maybe you can help me, because you guys are doing way better at it than me. Creative Finance, so I'll talk about a couple deals that I purchased Creative Finance um, that are now also operating midterm rentals. I own or operate 10, I think 11, I'm not sure, that's why I put the plus. Um, I have a degree in accounting from VCU, I think it's business accounting, from a long time ago, so I'm not gonna tell you when that was. And I also have a degree in hospitality management, which I didn't think was important until I started serving people, uh, funny enough. So, um, and then I have a network of 300 plus properties that I help other owners to get rented out to um, people on the midterm side. And then just a fun side note, I'm a huge Lego and Disney enthusiast. So, you know, we all talk about what's our why and um, why we do what we do. I really just want to buy a bunch of Lego sets and I want to go to Disney all the time. And I cannot do that on my W-2 job, which I do still have, by the way. And there's my little QR code that goes to my link tree. So if anybody wants to scan it, I have a ton of stuff on there, including my YouTube. Um, so if you guys want to subscribe to my YouTube, uh, feel free. Okay, so this was my former life while I still had a job, okay? I went back to culinary school because I was bored. This was after trying to be a realtor one time before, which doesn't work out very well if you're an introvert, by the way. Maybe it does for some people, it did not work out for me. Plus, I traveled for over 10 years, so I didn't actually know anybody and all my friends moved on with life without me. So when I came back here, I'm like, I wanna get into real estate, but I thought being a realtor was the only way to do it. Um, and then when I realized that wasn't going to work, I'm like, oh, I like to bake cakes. So I actually went back to culinary school, which is where I got my hospitality degree, along with um, an associate's in baking and pastry arts. And I had a bakery that I made custom cakes. So these are some of the cakes I made. I used to make cupcake bouquets. This is an actual chocolate cake. It's just a stack of pancakes and then a bagel, but it is a vanilla cake. Okay. But here was my problem. I got sick of people arguing with me about prices. And then COVID happened and I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm really interested in real estate. So I think this is the time that I'm going to start delving back um, into real estate. So I shut down my bakery. <sighs> I love baking cakes. I've not touched a pan, a whisk since then. It's very depressing, but I think I actually did a good job. It was a lot of fun, but I just got sick of people arguing with me at the, hey, I could go get that at Walmart, by the way. 
these same themes started coming up as I got into real estate too, which was, um, I could go get that from somewhere else or your price is too high or in some cases your price is too low. Um, and I used to tell people, you know what? I can call Walmart for you or I can call Kroger for you. I didn't realize I was actually doing a pull away, which we, a lot of us know in real estate. So that was my former life. And now I'm on the real estate side. So in my business, I have a mission to help a thousand families and travelers get placed into housing. I have a long way to go to get to a thousand, but it is a goal. Um, my big commitment is not just about money, it's about service. For me, everything surrounds service. If you can treat people right and you can serve them well, the money will come and you won't have to work as hard. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to work hard. So anybody who thinks that um, midterm rental is easy, it's not as easy as people try to make it sound. Um, and then my vision, which is to be a premier temporary housing provider, there's two, two reasons for that. Number one, if I shoot for the stars, I'm gonna continue to provide people massive service. Also, am I still in the camera? Yeah, okay. Also, I came across some people, and I'm not gonna say any names locally, but they had a company that they were selling, um, and it was actually a housing company. And I went to meet with them, and it was interesting how they talked really down to me, like I didn't know what I was talking about, even though I was in the industry that they worked in a lot, and I was one of the travelers. So now my goal is to overtake their business. I'm not an overly competitive person, but I am in this space. So that's part of my vision. So I'm coming for them. Okay, so the first thing about midterm rentals. What is a midterm rental? Does anybody have an answer of what a midterm rental is other than what I have on the screen? Perfect. What's your name? Brandon Jones. All right, Brandon. So Brandon says that it is a 12 or 13 week stay for travelers, construction workers, etc. Very good. Not always, but very close. Okay, so the reason why it's important to know what you mean when you say midterm is twofold. It's a time frame and it's a client. So short term usually is less than 30 days, unless you're in some places in Florida. And then short term actually means less than six months. It really just depends on where you are. So not every state or city defines short term as the same thing. And um, then long term, most people say is 12 or more months. That's your regular traditional renter. It's not intended for vacation stays, which I actually had to have this argument with an HOA here recently um, because they kept saying you're doing short term rentals and I said I wasn't. Um, so it's important to understand why you're gonna do this business because again, I'm telling you, it actually takes work if you wanna build it as a real business. It's not just sit back and wait for people to come to you. Um, learn the definitions of what things actually mean, especially when you start talking about short-term rentals versus um, mid-term rentals. Again, I do not like that term personally because it doesn't mean anything unless you know who you're serving and how you're gonna go after serving those people. I prefer to say extended stay, but it doesn't matter. I'm gonna use the term most people do. Um, and then you need to learn your market, whatever market that's gonna be. So how do you choose your location? And we're gonna talk about client avatars because these two things tie in together. The first thing is convenience and proximity. There were many times as a traveler where I was sent to the middle of nowhere like Watertown, South Dakota. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Watertown, South Dakota. There's nothing there. Well, there was a Walmart. And so I had to figure out where the Walmart was as a traveler because I did not want to have to drive two hours to get to the closest store because I have nothing but myself and my suitcase. What's the population for the actual area? The higher the population, the more people that you can serve, the more things that are happening in the area. This is the same thing we should be looking at on the long-term rental side too. It's just a little bit different because you'll see at the bottom where it says, home ownership versus a renter population. When you wanna do long-term rentals, you're looking for places that are building a ton of apartment complexes because there's a renter population there. But when you get into this side, especially if you wanna serve like on the insurance side, you need to know where there's a high homeowner population because those are gonna be your clients. So that part's really important. And then local industry. So I have my H's, highways. How close are we to the highway? 
And I'm not saying be at the highway, but how far is it for me to get there so I can get to my job or you know, wherever I need to be? How, how far would it take me to get to my kid's school from wherever I'm gonna stay? Um, hospitals. Most people think midterm, when they hear it, they think travel nurses. That's the first thing you hear people say all the time. It is very rare that you'll ever hear me say travel nurse. I will say travel medical professionals um, and because there's a wide range of people. But the reason that the hospital piece there is not because of travel nurses. It is because hospitals are strategically placed based on what's happening in the region. It's where would people go to a central location so they can get to a hospital. So if you start thinking about what's around you, um, you'll start seeing places where you should start looking for properties because you have more people there. Thank you. Um, next one, that would be the representative of an Amazon warehouse, but industry. What industry is happening in your area? So you'll have corporate travelers. Why would they need to come and stay with you? Again, I was a corporate traveler. So depending on the industries that are there or what's building in the area, you have another avatar that you can go out to as far as a client. And then the last one is, you see the half a sold sign, or for sale. Um, people move to your area. You wanna find out where people are migrating. So migration patterns are really important, especially if you wanna know who it is that you're serving. I serve a lot of people that have just sold a home and they don't have a place to go because they had to sell their house and they couldn't do a rent back. And if they try to do a rent back, they were gonna lose the offer because somebody wanted to move in. So what do you do with those people? A ton of people don't know what to do or they go stay with their families. I love my family, but no thank you. If my dad watches this on YouTube, I love you dad, but I don't wanna come live with you anymore. Okay, so <clears throat> one big thing to know when you're starting is regulations for your area. What are your state regulations? What are your city and county regulations? Is there an HOA? Lord help me with these HOAs, okay? We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, consider your neighbor influence. This is the same thing that people have to think about on the short-term rental side. Because just because you can get past these does not mean that your neighbors are not gonna cause you and your guests a problem, which they will a lot of times. So really be careful about where you're putting your properties and what you're gonna do as a business. Check pending changes because the rules are changing left and right everywhere. Like I think it's Dallas, short-term rental was fine there for a while, problems. Because you know why? Hotels are losing money and so they're gonna start lobbying and people are gonna make this big shift trying to get into midterm or they're going to quit, which I've seen a lot of people quit and I have a lot of people that own properties reaching out to me to see if I will buy them creatively from them because they are getting out of the short-term rental game. So it's really important to know your rules. I have this letter here, this is from Chesterfield County. I had a problem with an HOA who sent me a violation because they said I was illegally operating a short-term rental in the neighborhood. Their argument was Chesterfield County does not allow it. Okay, great. Well, I could either take what they said or I can go research it for myself, which is exactly what I did. I had to call the county three times, by the way, to actually get somebody to send this to me. Chesterfield County has defined that a short-term rental is not allowed in the county. I don't know if you guys knew that. In Chesterfield County, they say short-term rentals are not allowed at all. On top of that, they say you cannot use Airbnb as a platform because Airbnb is short-term rentals. That's what a lot of people think. So I'm so glad I got this when I went for my HOA board hearing, which was a whole nother story. But if you see, they're defining short-term rentals as less than 30 days. Their secondary piece says that therefore you cannot use the Airbnb platform. Now it's funny because I've done a few short stays and my money still gets sent to Chesterfield County and I've not gotten a refund. So they're happy to take my tax money. They just don't want me using this platform. So my argument to the HOA board, number one is very professional. I actually went in with a presentation because I do run a business. And so I asked them their concern. So when you're dealing with these things, Ask people questions. This goes right into everything we do in real estate. The more you know about the motivation or why somebody's giving you the answer they are, the easier it is for you to combat it. And so their argument was, you can't do Airbnb in Chesterfield County. <clears throat> I said, what does that mean? And they're like, you can't rent on Airbnb. And I said, why? 
She said, because Chesterfield County doesn't allow rentals or short-term rentals. I said, well, what's the definition of a short-term rental? Mind you, I had this in my pocket. They did not have this document. I did. So I'm asking all these questions. And I said, well, let me tell you a little about my business. And then I showed them this document. I said, so your argument with me, if I'm correct, is number one, your argument is I can't do short-term rentals, correct? They said, yes. I said, great. I don't do anything less than 30 days. Argument done. They can't argue with me about that because I don't do less than 30 days stays. Next one is you can't, you, you can't run an Airbnb. I said, well, Airbnb is a platform. Are you okay with me listing my property for rent on Zillow? Of course. Then what's the difference? You cannot tell me where I can advertise my property if you're okay with Zillow, which by the way, all the properties in here are advertised for sale on Zillow or rent, then Airbnb is nothing but a, mar a marketing platform. As soon as I got through with that hearing, I put my property right back on Airbnb. They cannot write me another violation because I am not operating outside of the county guidelines. So this is why it's really important for you to know the rules for your area, especially if you're in an HOA. Go get the CCNRs and read them. See what it says. Because a lot of times they'll make things up and hope that you don't argue it. Yes, Asif. Perfect. So CCNR, basically the short version of CCNR is their rules for what you can do in the community. So can I rent the property? Do I have permission to rent the property? Do I have to ask permission? What are the rules for everything that happens in the community? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, that's a short version of what it means. Anybody have any questions about why it's important to know the regulations in your area? Yeah. I love that question. So the, what was your name? Brennan. Brennan? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Can you repeat it for the mic? Oh, yeah. I'm just wondering how they uh, found out out of curiosity. Because they stalk people on Airbnb. What? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I asked that question too. And they, they kindly sent me a picture of my listing in my violation notice, <laughs> which was funny. So yeah, they stalk you on Airbnb. Um, now, I'm glad you asked that question because most people don't know. There's actually two sides of Airbnb. Did you all know that? Okay. One side of Airbnb is the everything side, which is the short stays, the everyday, et cetera. But there's another side of Airbnb that's Airbnb monthly stays. And if your stay is anything over what Airbnb defines at 28 days or more, you will not show up in a general search on the regular Airbnb platform. So you can do a Google search for Airbnb monthly stays. That's the secondary site. And you can go look for everyone that said they are open to taking monthly stays at their place. So mine will not show up on their regular Airbnb search because I'm not listed on that side because I don't do anything less than 30 days. So now they can go search me if they want. It just so happened that my first one, I put seven days, even though I wasn't going to do seven days because I just launched it and they found me on Airbnb. Normally I would be upset about that, but this is where gratitude comes in. I'm so grateful that they found it because I learned all this stuff and now I know how to navigate it. So, but yeah, they'll stalk you on Airbnb if they're like super serious about it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about client avatars. You guys like my animation here and my pictures. Okay, so first is traveling medical professionals. That can be nurses, doctors, I have radiology techs that stay with me all the time. There's a wide range of travelers, not just a nurse. So please, when you refer to these people, please refer to them as travel medical professionals. They would greatly appreciate not being called a nurse if they're not a nurse, no offense to nurses, but um, I get doctors all the time. So typically their assignments are three months, which goes back to what you said. However, they often extend in their locations. So I have two apartments in Midlothian and um, the first stay at one of them, the person stayed with me for seven months. She left, and the next person's been there for eight. So she started out at three months, now going on eight, and they just keep extending because there's a need in the area. So just because it starts out at the three-month stay doesn't mean that it will end at that because they tend to extend in the area where they are if you give them a really nice place to stay. Military relocation, which is a big one here because we're in, Fort Greg Adams. I'm going to make sure that I say that right. Um, because we're near Fort Greg Adams. Anybody here in the military? 
Nobody. That's an oddity. Okay, cool. So here's what happens. Maybe you guys know somebody in the military. So my uncle got sent to Germany, okay? Then he was told he had to come back. His stuff got picked up before he did, and then they got here before their stuff did. And there was nowhere for them to go on base. So they had to go stay in a hotel for three months. Remember, I told you I was a corporate traveler. Living in a hotel, especially if you got two young kids, I wouldn't do it on vacation at this point, more than two days. There's no way in the world that I want to spend multiple months in a hotel with three kids living in a box. So had they known that temporary housing was available, and it's not just apartments, it's houses, um, they would have gone to stay there. So I get a lot of people that are in the military who are waiting for a house to be built or they're trying to figure out if they like the area. And some people are just concerned that they're going to get PCS, which is shipped out again, even if they just got here. So they don't want to have to put their, their uh, furniture in the house. They'll just go put it in storage and then come stay in a furnished house. So military is a big one. Insurance claims. So there's a big buzz right now about insurance claims because anytime something hits bigger pockets, then, you know, it just hits the big blow. This is not new, by the way. Remember, I told you I've been in the insurance industry for 20 plus years. Not, not a new thing. It's just the newest thing for investors. Fires, if your house burned down. So I just helped place a family in San Antonio. Lord help these people. Their kids decided it was a good idea to set off fireworks um, for New Year's. Unfortunately, those fireworks burned their house down. So fires are a very big one. Water damage, and this is not just a regular flood. You can have freezing pipes. You know, you get all those notifications in the wintertime where it's super cold and they're like, make sure that your pipes drip. That's because if you don't, your pipes will freeze and then they will burst and they'll cause a whole lot of water damage in your house. Or like my aunt and uncle, bless them, had a toilet that kept running upstairs. Kept running, kept running, kept running. Well, the toilet was leaking and they didn't know it. And they left and came home and there was a giant hole in their ceiling and everything fell down, okay? Water damage is a big one. That's probably my number one reason people come and stay with me is because they had a pipe burst in their house and they're having the repairs done. And then hurricanes, tornadoes, which we don't necessarily get a ton of those here, um, but they happen you know, nationwide. Those are the claims I used to work all the time. Construction teams. So they're a big one for one of my places in North Carolina. First thing is they typically travel in groups, okay? So how expensive is it for 10 people to go get individual hotel rooms? Extremely expensive. Or you could put them in a house all together, which most of them do not care, and the cost is significantly reduced. Now you as an operator, you can charge a higher price for having a larger home, but they're actually saving money. So you're making money, they're saving money. The company is usually the one that pays. I mostly work business to business. I don't work with a lot of individuals. I know where everybody's money is coming from, which helps with my pricing. Um, corporate travel, which again is what I did. So you'll get a lot of corporate travelers. They may stay on extended assignments. <clears throat> Hotels are great, again, for a very short period. But if you have to eat out every day, not a great thing. I just learned how to save my money while I was traveling. Um, and I just stacked it. Thank you to my company for giving me free money. Um, but nobody wants to go out and eat at McDonald's every day. Or if you have really high taste, like Caroline would say, go to Nobu all the time. That's where Pace goes a lot. I need to talk to him because we have not been to Nobu together yet. But, um, but people also have rotating work assignments. So if you get a contract with a company and they just want to rotate their workers through, you've got guaranteed money coming in all the time. Okay. Um, and then people that are in between homes, which we talked about, you can have corporate relocations. I've done three corporate relocations with my company. The best part was they came and picked up all my stuff and they also shipped it down. Unfortunately, I got there before my stuff did. So I stayed in temporary housing during my relocations. Um, so that is a really, really big one. Also, sometimes again, people want to check out the area before they commit to buying a house. So um, that's a really big one. And then we talked about the fact that rent backs aren't possible all the time. So if you guys don't know what a rent back is, I just got a house, my house under contract for somebody to buy it, but I need three months until I find another house or I can move. And the person said, no, 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 we wanna move into the house in 30 days. Well, what do you do? 
Again, you can pack up and go stay with your family. Maybe you got maybe you guys are okay with that. I just at 43, I just can't I just can't do it. Um, but some people do. Now, I had a situation recently with a family that did just that. They sold their house and they went to live with family. Unfortunately, they had dogs. The one family member that said they could come would not let them bring the dogs. But they didn't have enough room for everybody either. So the family had to split up. They were building a house in the Highlands and their house was not ready on time. They had been living with family separated for three months. When this lady called me, she was in tears. She said, if we cannot get into another place where we can get our family back together, I think my daughter's gonna have a panic attack. Luckily, we were able to get them in housing. So again, this is all about service. There's stories behind the people that are staying with you. Digital nomads, which at some point in my life, I think, as a matter of fact, I kind of did that. I sold my house. I literally put all my stuff in storage. It was the best part of my life. I had two bills for the most part, my car insurance and my storage unit. It was wonderful. And then I just took my computer and went everywhere. So digital nomads, they're also a very good resource for um, clients. Students and professors, which were all near VCU, really big one. Did you guys know they have traveling professors come into VCU? All the time, okay? So they also need temporary housing. So again, this goes back to choosing your location based on your clients and who you think you're gonna serve. If I'm a professor, I probably don't wanna stay, although I've had people do it, I don't wanna stay all the way out in Midlothian or Powhatan if I'm working at VCU, unless, I also went to VCU, so I see some people have VCU shirts, okay? So unless you don't wanna deal with the terrible parking, because parking there is horrible, you don't wanna have to pay to park in a parking deck overnight, which costs you probably the same cost as rent. Um, so a lot of travelers are students or professors, and they stay in temporary housing. And then this is a, another one that people sleep on all the time. How many times has somebody knocked on your door if you own a home trying to sell you solar? A lot of those people are brought into the area. They don't necessarily work here, so they're on teams. They also need places to stay, a lot of times in groups. So these are just a few of the client, that's what, nine, three pages, so nine client avatars. That's not all of them, but that's nine client avatars that you could go after if you're doing extended stay rentals or midterm rentals. I'm gonna say it because I have to, but I don't really want to. So how do you acquire these properties? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it back on the other topic? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back so, to my own uh, So out of the avatars. And it's fancy. I like to look at it. I work real hard on this presentation. <laughs> so, so, hold on. I'm trying to formulate the question in my head. Okay. Which avatar, uh, I mean, which, I don't know. Let me, let me, let me, let me think. I'm trying to find out which avatar would you prefer uh, uh, and again, are there any avatars that make more money than the other? Okay, that's the question. Yes, there are. So, yeah, that's... It all depends on where their money's coming from, okay? Okay. So let's think about this. Travel medical professionals. I told you I won't say travel nurse. Travel medical professionals. Those people are coming in on assignment. They're being paid a premium for their job, and a lot of times they're getting additional money for stipends, but the money's still coming out of their pocket, okay? A lot of those people have rent or a mortgage to pay at home, and to be honest, a lot of them are paying off student loans. So one of my friends who used to work with me at the company I still work for, she left and went to be a nurse and went into traveling. She spent all of her money on paying off her debt and her husband's debt. So they're not trying to spend but so much. Now, do they want to be comfortable? Yes, but there's a lot of those travelers that are okay sharing a space. So they'll do private rooms, they'll do a studio, they may want a singular one bedroom apartment, I personally would not share a space with somebody, but again, I used to be a traveler, so, and I like my space. But there's a lot of people who will. And those budgets are typically lower if they're looking for a private room in somebody else's space or sharing or a studio. A lot of times, like if you look on Furnish Finder, those are the ones that are less than 1200 a month. Now, <clears throat> one of my apartments, which I'll show you, I have a travel, she is a nurse, so she's a travel nurse, she's working at St. Francis. She pays, I think her rent on this one is $2,400 a month, something like that, um, which she told me in the beginning was a little expensive. But when she saw all the amenities that I offered and the location, she was happy to stay. 
Then this is the one that's going on eight months. I just met her for the first time yesterday, as a matter of fact. And when I went over to the house, cause I had to pick up, or the apartment, I had to pick up some paperwork. She told me how much she loved it. It's the best place that she's ever stayed the entire time, right? But I know where her money's coming from. So I have to look at her a little bit differently than I would a company. Remind me to add something about companies versus individuals when I'm done with this part, okay? Um, now, if your money's coming from a company, that's a different story. Because they have deeper pockets, okay? They, it's just a fact. The company has deeper pockets because they set aside budgets for housing. So my insurance days typically are my highest. That's because the money's coming from an insurance company, okay? That does not mean that we price gouge people just because, well, I'm going to talk about it right now, okay? So... That does not mean I advertise my house on Furnish Finder for $4,000 a month, or let me just $2,000 a month. And then just because an insurance carrier or one of the third party agencies reaches out to me, I'm gonna bump up my price that was listed on Furnish Finder for two or $3,000 to $7,000, which by the way, I hear happens all the time, okay? I told you I do a lot of business to business, so a lot of my clients are uh, with insurance. They're getting pissed off about it, first off, rightly so. They should be. But think about this. If you went to the grocery store and you saw a price advertised on the shelf, it's on sale or whatever, and then you go to the register and it rings up higher, and then you go tell the person, well, wait a minute, the sticker said $2. I'm going to use $2 as an example because I like Cheez-Its, and this just happened to me yesterday. So Cheez-Its are on sale for 2 bucks. When they're not on sale, they're like $5 a box. I will not buy them when they're $5 a box, but I will buy multiples at $2 a box. I go to the register, they ring up for $5. Now, if the lady says, well, I know it says it's advertised for $2, but you still gotta pay $5. How happy would you be about that? Not very. Because I've already advertised a price that you literally see, and I'm trying to change it just because I know that you have more money. That, to me, that's just bad business. And it's happening a lot. But do I love my insurance? Yes, because they pay more. I get some rentals, I have $10,000 a month. Some are six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 a month. But I also understand the services I'm providing. I understand what people need. So yes, insurance will typically, not always, typically pay more. But remember, everybody's insurance policy is different. You and I can own the same house and not have the same limits. Like I have one in um, Georgia I'm working with right now for somebody and unfortunately, the person's policy limit will only give them $3,000 a month. But the house, I usually could rent out for seven or eight. But we're working with them, two reasons. The house is vacant and the homeowner needs to get it rented and the person needs a place to stay. Does that answer your question? Do you have a question? Okay, awesome, awesome, okay. Anybody else have any questions before we move on? No, okay. Okay, so, Acquisition strategies. So you can go the traditional route. By the way, there's nothing wrong with buying houses using loans. I'm just gonna say that, there's nothing wrong with that. I bought my first four houses using traditional loans. Now, I used a home equity line of credit for the down payment. The house paid for both, the regular loan. My interest rates were 3.25% at the time that I purchased them, which was very nice. That is not a thing today, but that's okay. So you can still use traditional loans, hard money loans. You can do the Burr method. I know Philip is very good at um, you know those types of things. I don't do flips. I don't do rehabs. Gene walked in the door. Gene has let me pick out some stuff in his um, flips before, but if you ask me to work with a contractor, I'm probably very useless. Thank you for agreeing. I appreciate it. Okay, now you could do arbitrage. Arbitrage is nothing more than I rent out a space, I have the, the allowance to rent it out again, and then I rent it out to somebody else. That's all arbitrage is. I have done that. I'm actually getting out of the arbitrage game because I got a lot of reasons. Or you could do lease options, by the way, on the creative side. You could lease option a property if you want, rent it out using this method, and then have the option to buy it if you want to later. If you see that it's doing really, really well, and then you want to buy it at the end of your lease option term, you could do that, right? And then whatever credits you've built in, however you structured your lease option, you're walking into equity, hopefully. Okay, and then a lot of us know about creative finance. So you can buy these properties subject to, you can do seller finance, you can do a hybrid of the two, and you can still do lease options. I'm sure there's maybe another way somewhere, but I don't know what it is. 
Okay, so these are a couple of, or these are, I think there's three examples of my own properties. So this is one of my arbitrages. So when I first started out, Lord help me. I, I didn't show the picture on here because I'm just not going to. My first one, I had a heck of a time trying to get somebody to tell me yes. A bunch of people told me, no, 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 you cannot rent our place. I didn't have experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I thought I knew what I was doing, but I really didn't. So I got an apartment complex to actually say yes to me uh, for an arbitrage. The great part was they were not full, so they had vacancy. So I realized as I started um, studying how to talk to sellers that I could take that same thing and tie into this side of the business to figure out what people's actual problems were and how to solve it. This apartment complex's problem was they needed to fill their vacancies because we know as investors, vacancies lose us money and they cost us money. So, um, but this one <clears throat> is an apartment complex out in Midlothian. The rent is $1,500 a month. Now this one only cost me $300 to get in. And you might say, how the heck did you get in with $300? Well, I already rented one apartment from them, which was doing really well. So I got them to agree to only take a um, security deposit. So instead of doing another month rent, um, they said, no, we'll just take the $300 security deposit. And they lowered the rate for me. I got them to lock in the rent rate for three years, but I can cancel after one year if I want to. And then um, it cost me nine grand to furnish it, which I did not do, by the way. So after my first one, I tried to do, I'm a coupon shopper, okay? I'm not cheap. I'm fiscally responsible. That's the way I like to say it. I used to call my dad cheap until I understood when I had to spend my own money. So I went to Facebook Marketplace, which you can do, by the way. Facebook Marketplace. I got real creative. I hired people on Thumbtack to go pick up furniture and deliver it. I was going to pick up beds. I got a, a bed in my first apartment for 100 bucks because somebody was selling it, and I just had to go pick it up. Great. This one was professionally designed. The designer I use, it's um, Transformations by Jill. So if anybody is looking for a great designer, whether it's, um, she does staging for homes, she does short-term rentals, she's learning how this, the difference is on the midterm rental side. So Transformations by Jill, she's awesome. She makes my life so easy because she loves shopping and I hate it. So we are a wonderful match. Um, so. This one, rent plus utilities, 1,700 bucks. I forgot to add in that I got private money. So technically this whole thing was free to me. I spent $0 out of my pocket to rent this apartment and get the furnishings. I pay my private lender $66.67 per month. Very exciting. They gave me 10 grand. Why did they do that? Because their money's not making them anything in the bank. And they trust me. Because this is not like it's a, um, they're getting a deed of trust or a position on a loan. They trust me, they know me. I actually showed them what my business was, so they were happy to give me money. And then my rent rates are somewhere between 2,500 to 3,500 on this property, depending on where it's coming from. The nurse side, travel medical, I say nurse because I've had three of them stay there. Travel medical is a little lower, but when the people book on Airbnb, the rate is higher on Airbnb than it is on Furnish Finder. That is a tip charge more on Airbnb because people actually expect to pay more on Airbnb. So list, list your price as high as you want. And then if you're not getting things, then you can drop it down, right? Because we can always ask for more. It's very hard. Remember, goes back to what we said. If you advertise low, you need to give them the price that you advertise. Hello. Hey, Tanisha. Um, when you're setting pricing, do you use a, a pricing software like Price Labs or something like that? Or no. You, no, you got to do it manually? Don't. Okay. I do not. Now, I know some people that do that. They'll use Price Labs, but the data they get is only as good as the information they're getting from people actually operating with them, okay? It's the same thing with Furnish Finder. Furnish Finder, the data is only as good as the data that people are putting into it. So if anybody has used Furnish Finder, when you get a renter or you update your listing dates, they ask you, do you want to update tenant tracking? And then they ask you how long the person's staying. They ask you what rate you paid for them. That's where that data is coming from. If I don't ever give it to them, they don't have it. If my properties are not booked through Airbnb or VRBO, right, where's their data coming from? None of my bookings, well, not none, but most of my bookings don't come from that. They're direct, so they'll never have that data. However, I know a lot of people that use pricing softwares, and that's totally fine. It's all about how you want to do your business. Um, I've just learned how to do the pricing, and I'd use Airbnb to go look and see what other people are doing. I read a lot of their reviews because that tells you why people are coming to stay. That's another tip. Go on Airbnb, look at people doing longer stays and read their reviews. 
it'll tell you on there, people stayed for two weeks or people stayed for a few weeks or people stayed for a month. Read the descriptions, read the um, comments. People are literally telling you who's coming to stay with them. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So my primary client, client avatars for this apartment, travel medical, digital nomads, people that come on extended family visits. I get a lot of them over the holidays that stay for a month or two. Um, pending home builds, corporate relocations, divorces and separations. Lord help me, I get a lot of those. My pastor told me we just need to take a break. So I'm gonna come stay with you for a month while I'm taking a break from my husband. I've had that several, several times, okay? The stories are fun. Okay, so this one is a townhouse I just bought in Chester. Um, this is the one I had my little HOA hearing with. This one was a wholesaler referral. Now the funny part was I actually saw this one on the market. So technically it was an expired listing. Um, it was a pre foreclosure and um, it was a vacant property. This is a 2022 build. People got divorced, lived in it for four months and dipped out and never made one payment on the mortgage. <laughs> so that was fun. 5% interest rate, it's a VA loan. So a lot of people think, oh my gosh, I can't buy a property subject to with a VA loan. Did I say I bought this sub two? I don't know, but I did, I forgot, sorry. This was a sub two that I bought. 5% interest rate. Now, I was not necessarily a fan of the 5% part, but the rest of it worked out, so it's okay. It cost me $25,000 to have Jill furnish this house. I did not do it, okay? I, I, don't, I don't like shopping, just don't. Um, the mortgage on this house is $2,200, and the rent rate is between six dollars and $7,000 a month. So I just had to move in today. So this is the beautiful part why I tell people, use all your resources for listing, like on Airbnb. The person that moved in today, has been staying in a hotel in Chester, had water damage in their house, wanted to get out of the hotel, got the booking from Airbnb, from a rep that I actually know, which is, which is funny enough. They just moved in, they're paying $6,000 for the first month. And remember, I told you, my HOA told me I couldn't use Airbnb. The reason I needed to argue with them about that is because I get a decent amount of bookings from Airbnb, and that's where this one came from. So this house is fully furnished and I mostly get insurance displacements, corporate travelers, again, the pending home build. This is the one that that family came to, the one that was separated, and then military relocations because it's in Chester, so it's close to Fort Greg Adams. Ask so just, it's two bedrooms, right? This one is a two bedroom, two full and two half baths. Do you remember the breakdown of the uh, $25,000? Like that seems kind of high to me, I don't know. but I, The I don't 25 know furnishing about. costs? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a three-level townhouse. <clears throat> I could pull it up on Airbnb, but the bottom level has an office space. It has two seating areas and a pull-out couch and a whole TV space. It's like an entertainment plus office, and if they need to bring somebody else in, it's a pull-out couch. So technically, it would be a bedroom, but there's no, you know, it's not a bedroom. So that's one. The second level, it's three spaces. So it's this area, which is the living space, the kitchen is in the center, and you can see on the back side, there's a whole kitchen space. There's a, a half bath on the bottom, a half bath at this level. The third level is the two full bedrooms. They're very large bedrooms. Um, the, the primary bedroom, which is that room on the, corner, on the end, two closets. Um, so you, you can see, like, it, it was a lot to furnish. It's, like the, six it's a lot of spaces. And the second bedroom, we have two twin beds in there that convert to a king, which we had to convert because the person wanted a king. So now we can have more occupancy. So would I normally buy a two bedroom? Heck no. Normally I wouldn't buy a two bedroom because I work with more families and they need more space. But I was able to turn this into more functional space. Um, and I've actually found that it does really, really well. So very good question. But it's a three level. It's not like a two or a one townhouse. It is a three level townhouse. So. Yes, that's why it costs, and that was not my budget, by the way, okay, not my budget, but because I raised more, also, I bought this house with zero dollars out of my pocket, okay, private money lender, and I raised more money than I needed because my designer likes to shop, okay, just, does that tell you anything? She loves shopping, so she a little goes overboard, but every time somebody walks into this house, like even today, on my way here, I got a message from the people who moved in today. They said, this house is beautiful. We're so excited to stay here. 
that's why I'm okay that we spent $25,000. On top of the fact that we make six to seven a month and I could probably bump it more if I want to. Okay, any other questions before I move on to the next one? Okay. This house I bought in North Carolina end of last year. This one was on the MLS with an agent. So for people who say you can't get creative deals off market, not true. The beautiful part was this agent had bought her house subject to, which was wonderful. 3.25% um, interest rate, VA loan. Um, that initial entry fee, the 20,000 was $7,000 to the seller and the rest of it went to the agent. So the agent got paid more money than the seller, but we solved the seller's problem because they built this house 2022 and like March, something like that. November, they got orders to get shipped to Missouri. So they had to get out, but they just built a house. They also bought a house at their next place. So now they're paying two mortgages. Who wants to pay two mortgages in here? I know I don't. I know you don't. I can tell because you're laughing. Nobody wants to pay two mortgages. They couldn't sell the house and they also couldn't rent it. So I came in, bought it sub two, called the agent on market. I don't even talk to sellers that often. I talked to agents, but I didn't actually expect for this one to go through. I was really, this goes to your point when you were talking to me about being afraid to get on the phone. I did not get on the phone with the intent to buy a deal. I was on the phone trying to overcome my fear of getting on the phone, okay? And I ended up buying a house. That just so happened, I was not necessarily looking for that, okay? It cost $25,000 to furnish this one too. Also over budget, Lord help me. Which brings me to a point, okay? Please make sure your designers, if you're working with a designer, understands who you're serving and what you need in your place. I love this house, it's beautiful. I've only seen it once, but it's a beautiful, beautiful space. Some extra stuff she put in here is not necessary, okay? Let me ask you guys something. Don't everybody answer all at once. In your house, where do you put your underwear? It's not a trick question. Thank you. There's only one dresser in this five bedroom house, okay? This is on me because, you know, I was getting married and not paying attention and this lady kind of went left, but again, at the end of the day, it's my fault. There's one dresser in that room and the only reason there's a dresser is because she put the TV on top of it. The rest of the TVs in the other four bedrooms, she mounted. So I call her and I said, hey, um, what's missing here? And she said, what? I said, there's no dressers. And she said, well, they can just put their stuff in the closet. And I said, when's the last time you hung up your underwear on a hanger? Okay, really important <coughs> to think about those types of things. I have dressers in all my places, except for this one, okay? This one rents between five and $6,000 a month. My mortgage is 1,900. Our total expenses overall for the month is somewhere between 23 and 2,400. So we're making very good money every month. Construction teams are my number one because they're building houses in the area. They have a ton of projects going on. This one's not too far from uh, Fort Liberty, all these name changes, so I gotta remember what they're called. Fort Liberty in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So I get a lot of military training ops and jobs that are happening on base. Um, and then pending home builds because what? It, they're building houses in the area. These last two properties both were built in 2022, by the way. I told you, I don't do flips and I don't do rehabs. God bless Eugene and Philip. I will come walk them all day. Gene, I'm happy to keep picking out some stuff, maybe. But I don't know that I'm ever gonna do a flip because I just, I don't know, I just don't. Maybe one day. Okay, so one of the main reasons I do what I do, the money's great, okay? The money is really great. But it's really the service that I care about. Remember I told you, I was in the insurance industry I work claims with people who basically lost everything. The worst claim that I ever handled was um, in Houston. It was a massive flood. This man got stuck on the side of the road with his family in a truck. It was his wife and their baby. The water was rising really, really high. So they had to get out of the truck. Massive wave comes by, sweeps them into this makeshift lake. The guy grabs onto a tree. He, then he grabs onto his wife and his wife could not hold the baby. They lost the baby. So every person I serve, I think about some story that they have that's happening to them. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try not to cry, but 
I remember it still so vividly because I had to listen to this man cry on the phone with me about losing his daughter. So service for me is really, really, really important. And the better you serve people, again, the better they'll treat, number one, they'll treat your place better if you serve them well. And that's what we want. Remember, I don't, I don't do rehabs. I buy houses that are turnkey, but these guys do rehabs. You guys put a ton of money into these houses. You don't want people coming in and tearing them up if you just fix them up. So this was an insurance day I had at our house in Arizona. She started out at 30 days. I knew she wasn't going to stay for 30 days, by the way. The minute she told me what happened in her house, I already knew she was going to be with me at least three months. She didn't know that. She stayed with me for six months at $8,500 a month on a house that we paid $2,600 um, for all expenses plus the mortgage. Also another house that we bought subject to. And then Andy actually stayed at my apartment in Midlothian because his son was trying out for the professional sports team and he was at, what's that place in Midlothian? I, I forget now, but there's a huge sports facility in Midlothian. I cannot remember the name to save my life. See, I can't think of, I can't think of it just, yes, yeah, in Midlothian. Just because I'm thinking of it is why I can't come up with it. His son stayed with me for six weeks. Okay. The best part was they brought extra stuff in the house. He brought tons of toilet tissue and paper towels, and he didn't like my one slice toaster, so he went and bought a two slice toaster, and guess what happened when he left? All that stuff stayed. Do you know all that extra stuff he left, I didn't have to buy for a year. I just shared it with my next people. Wonderful. So now I'm saving money too. But service is extremely, extremely important to me. I think I have one more up here. Or maybe I don't. I thought I put two. But, um, but the service piece is really, really important. This is the number one reason why I do what I do. The money comes if you treat people right. But you have to know who you're serving and why you're serving them, which is why in the beginning when I said define your why, learn your market, learn your properties, and who they can actually serve. Because once you figure that out, the rest of it's actually a lot easier. Now, I'm not saying that um, it's not hard sometimes, okay? I have a couple houses that I have to work a little harder than others. That's how I learned a lot better about picking my market. But once I figure that out, the rest is okay. But you got to be willing sometimes to get on the phone and build relationships. Ask people questions why they're staying with you. All of my people that come for training ops, I literally ask them, do you guys have people coming behind you? Oh, yeah, we do. Who's their coordinator? pass me to the coordinator. And then they just keep repeating at my house because they've already had people stay there. That's how you build a business. Again, one property is fine, but this is how I'm growing my actual business to business. So anybody have any questions? Yes, he put, it, oh, oh, <laughs> he put his hand up real fast. He's hiding in the uh, men in black chair. So how do you manage vacancies? What do you mean? Vacancies uh, between clients. What do you mean? How do I manage vacancies? Like, say you have a client for th th three months. Mm -hmm. So the next one may or may not come in the next month. So mm -hmm. there's a vacancy of a couple of months, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the average? How you manage it? Like, so this is the thing. Though. So great question. So I don't do short term stays. Okay. For the most part, I don't do short term. Some people will do a hybrid. They'll do midterm and short term stays. The problem with that sometimes is you bring in people on the short term and then you get a long request for a longer stay and then you can't take them because you've already committed to a shorter stay. My typical vacancy is about a month. That's typical. I'm okay with that. And the reason I'm okay with that is because number one, when I bought the property and when I continue, my requirement is that my holding account has three months of vacancy considered. So it's already paid. So I'm constantly stacking my holding account. Okay, so I don't have to pull money out of my own pocket. But the second thing is because my rates are higher, I'm actually okay on those periods, which also gives me the flexibility to say no to people. Because I do get a lot of requests that I turn down, whether it's people with really large pets that I don't want to deal with because pets tear up your place. Sorry. Some of my places don't, are not pet friendly because we spent $25,000 to furnish them. Um, so it really just depends on your location. This is why it's so important to figure out what's happening around you. Because 
you have to be okay with vacancy. By the way, short-term operators deal with the same stuff. So do long-term landlords. I had a house in Indiana. It was vacant for two months during a transition. I don't manage that one. That's a long-term rental. Do you think I was happy with two months? No. But because we charge a higher rent there, it's okay. But, you know, vacancy is just part of every rental game. We got a question back here, I think. I have a question about your your structure up front when you have when you're pulling money from hard money. Do you have a metric like you want to pay that all off in 12, 24 months with the rental income? Um, I don't do hard money loans. So private I do private money loans. Philip might do hard money loans. Gene might do hard money loans. I'm picking on them because I know they do flips. I do private money loans. I do not anticipate that I'm going to pay anybody off in 12 months. My loans are typically three to five years. And I tell people that, and they're okay with that. But I also know where their money's coming from too. So if I'm borrowing private money, I need to know where people's money is coming from because I need to know if they're borrowing from something else to give me money, I need to make sure that I'm thinking about their money and making sure that they're covered too. But I don't do anything less than three years at this point. And really, the longer the better. It's no different than on a subject two when somebody says, I want a balloon. I'm scared of balloons. No, literally, I'm scared of balloons, like real, real ones, okay? Um, so I'm scared of balloons in real life, and I don't like balloons in real estate. I have one property that has a balloon. It's a seven year. And what I wrote into the contract was, if the property doesn't appraise in seven years, we automatically extend for another two. And that is my option, not theirs. So, um, so I don't do short-term private money loans on purpose. And then yes, I do pull money from the cash flow to, I pay them their interest, and then I have a portion set aside to, to start capitaling back their payment to. I don't get paid until everything else is paid, including my war chest, which is my maintenance, my repairs. I set aside money for, I just set aside money for all kinds of stuff. I told you like, when people say they're not cheap, they're fiscally responsible, means they don't like to spend money, which means they're scared to lose it. So I will set a lot of money aside that I don't have to. Also, I have a job, so it helps. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Um, so my question is, I'm looking into data scrapers and algorithms, because um, I do Airbnb and I look into midterm rentals also. So in the title, I have Liberty University. We're also near Framatome in near Lynchburg. Yep. Um, but how do you find these people? Because that's the to, to come in and and rent. So who are the people that you would like to go after based um, off of all those avatars? I, I really like the professionals. So which um, professionals? Uh, I kind of want the people in from Framatome. They're, um, they put like uranium on rods or something like that. And okay. then also like uh you know doctors or traveling nurses but i don't and i'm on furnished finder but i probably get like yeah so airbnb people all the people that find me for like liberty are mm -hmm. not the professors or the long-term professionals uh -huh. they're all the grandparents and parents that want to come see their kids graduate so i'm trying to figure out how they find me but the professionals don't that would stay for longer it depends on so first thing it depends on where they're looking so that company you mentioned um have you looked up how to get in contact with their HR department? No. Google is a wonderful resource, okay? My, my friend Caroline, she's my best friend in sub two. My friend Caroline always tells people the best resource that she likes is spelled Y-O-U-T-U-B-E. I'm spelling it because she spells it, YouTube. Google is a wonderful resource, and I'm saying that seriously. Put in the name of the company, HR department, and just start picking up the phone. That's how you do it. You could, you could use LinkedIn, but not everybody responds on LinkedIn. A lot of people are not on LinkedIn. Call the company first. Just pick up the phone. Because see, what happens is we'll sit back and we'll be like, well, I know this company's there, but what do I do? And then we just look around and we look around. But the easy answer was just to pick up the phone. By the way, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Michelle, right? A lot of this I'm saying based on our conversation about the, you know, sometimes we just have to pick up the phone. I was scared. Kanye West was my best friend, I'm telling you. Sometimes you just gotta pick up the phone. That'll, that'll be a very good resource for you. I, would, I also, if I'm you, I would call the university as well and find out 
if they have people coming in that are on assignment and they need housing and how do you get in contact with somebody that's responsible for the contracts that come in that will help you a lot mm -hmm. thanks again for the picture frame for our wedding really appreciate it hi there hey again hey let's curious uh for the property management aspect of that, are you doing you that yourself? I don't know if they can hear you in the mic, but I can't hear you. For the property management aspect of this, are you doing it yourself or are you outsourcing that as well? How does that work with the different properties and different strategies you're using? I manage all my own properties um, because it's not that complicated, to be honest. Um, once people are in, if you have a really quality place and you vet your people appropriately, they don't really call you that often. Sometimes I have to check in with people and see if they're still alive. Um, and that may sound crazy, but I told you, I got some people that stay with me for a long time. So I'll just check in with them and see if they're okay. My insurance people, I check with them a little more often just to make sure their repairs are going okay. But I also help them deal with their insurance claims too. Like that lady I told you went from 30 to six months. I helped her get extensions and helped her get the contractors to actually do repairs on her house based on my experience in the industry. So I manage my own properties. There are some people I know that are starting to do management. Um, technically I'm supposed to be going to a brokerage where we're talking about a property management division, but I've not gotten that far in my life yet. So, um, I don't do property management for other people right now, but I do help other people with marketing. The, the management isn't complicated, but I use some of the same resources people use on the short term side. Like I use IGMS for my automated messaging. So like I'm here right now, but there's messages being sent to people while I'm standing here talking to you. Did that answer your question? Okay, cool. Hi, how are you? This is a great presentation. Oh, it's thank very, you. I worked very, really hard on the presentation part. Yeah, so um, we do short term um, and we do long term as well on Airbnb. Midterm is something that we've never wanted, wanted to touch just because we didn't know, say we take a client that's already in, in the apartment or the house, what do we, how do we find the next one? Um, so my question for you is, how how far ahead do, or how far ahead do you do your vetting process? What does the vetting process look like for the next client that you have? Um, so my stays are typically within seven to ten days. So short so short term rentals are different because people are planning vacations, right? Most of my people are not planning for a pipe to burst in their house at all. I hope it never happens to anyone, but if it does, come see me. So a lot of my stuff is like emergency or last minute. Now I get a lot of people that reach out to me when I already have a booking. And if somebody's going to leave, it's possible that they can wait, but if they can't, I try to help them find other housing. So that's a service I also give to people is, um, this is why I told you I have 300 plus properties in my network at this point, because I continue to help people try to find housing. It's a little tough because you guys are hoping people book with you out because it fills up your calendar. I'm expecting that most people that stay with me, even if they start at 30 days, they're gonna be with me for a minimum of three months. So I don't have to worry so much about the vacancy piece because they tend to stay longer. Does that help a little bit? Again, it goes back to what I said, like you guys could do a hybrid of both, but if most of your stuff comes from short term and you're okay running that business, then great. And if you have a longer period of occupancy and you can take someone, great. But what you're going to run into is if you have an overlap on the back end of your calendar, somebody comes to stay with you for 30 days, their house, let's say it's a repair, their house isn't ready and you've already taken another booking. Now they have to move multiple times. It's one of the reasons why I don't take confirmed back to back bookings until I've confirmed the person that's going to stay with me is leaving for a fact, leaving because uh, nope, I thought I was going to be able to say I had one that did not extend, but I have never had one person that did not extend, not one time. Everybody extends every single time. Um, I have a house in Midlothian, was a failed listing, and I, I don't really manage, but it's like a half an arbitrage, sort of, but I'm working with the owner. And um, that one started out at 30 days, they're going on four months, because their repair didn't even start until month three even though it was supposed to start three, three months before that. So that's, that's the only thing about hybrid of short term and midterm. You have to just watch your calendar going forward. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Anybody else? Oh, hi again. Hi again. So uh, the example is uh, gave us the, the apartment that you lease in Midlothian. Mm -hmm. So 
your contract with the apartments was a commercial contract or uh, how how did you manage that i signed a, a residential lease agreement and it's in my company name and then you oh, okay all right mm -hmm. okay. and then i have an agreement with them that i can sublease sub mm -hmm. yeah which by the way i'm so glad you brought this up there's a lot of people who do this and then they don't tell the truth about what they're doing okay i don't like to operate like that um, it's so much easier if you just tell them what you're going to do. And then if they say no, and it's a flat out, no, find somewhere else. If you're going to do arbitrage, don't make your life hell. It's not necessary at all. Like that apartment complex, the only pushback they gave me was they wanted to do background checks. And so, you know, I'm going to send this section to pace because thank goodness that even though I was afraid to talk to sellers, I still study pace of seller calls because I learned how to overcome objections and see what people's actual problems were. Our whole job is to solve problems. Their biggest problem was they needed to do background checks because they needed a vet who was in the community. I said to them, my only concern, I'm happy to do background checks. My only concern is what you're asking me to do is to take somebody's information that I don't know, get them to write their social security number on a piece of paper and then hand it to you whom also they don't know. And I don't really know you that well either. So I'm thinking that's not gonna work. Would you do that? And the lady was like, heck no, I wouldn't do that. Great. So we have an agreement. So what I said was, what if I do the background check, but I send you the results for everybody that stays here? She said, I think that'll work. Because remember, those background check services, they already pay for a service fee. They pay one-time fee. Everything else when they charge people is a markup. They're just making money off of it. I don't charge people money for background checks, but they got to pay for it. I use a service called Rent Prep. That's on my QR code that was at the beginning. I should have put it on the back. I use a service called Rent Prep. All I have to do is get the person's email. I email the request to them. They fill everything out. And so now I don't have to get their information. But I just signed a lease with my company name on it. And it did have a personal guarantee, which I'm totally fine with because, I mean, I'm fiscally responsible, so I got money in my bank account just in case. But they're not coming to look for me. I told you, they gave me a whole other apartment for 300 bucks, which did not come out of my pocket. Hello, Asif. Hey, Tanisha. So... I don't think you have had the problem because you say everybody that stayed with you extended, mm -hmm. right? But I'm just thinking out loud. What if somebody signs up with you for three months mm -hmm. and then they decide they don't want to stay there for three, three months? They want to leave early. Okay. Have you heard of any such situation? I've seen people have that problem. I personally haven't had that issue. However, think about the business that you're running. Number one, why do they need to leave? Now... I know a lot of people that have travel medical professionals come stay with them and their contract got canceled. That's not their fault. If I'm running my business, I'm not going to make you pay for this extended lease when you had no control over the fact that your contract got canceled. However, I am going to ask you to prove it because I've seen people that have said, oh, my contract got canceled for other people, not me. My contract got canceled and it really didn't. They just didn't want to stay there and they just were too scared to say it or they wanted to quit because they hated the contract that they were in. So I've never personally had that happen. Again, all my people extend, but would I consider it? Yeah, for the right reason. Hello again. Before you were tenured and really had your credibility, like how did you find uh, your private money lenders and how did you pitch your deal? So, um, you know, the best way to get private money lenders is to tell them stories. It really is. So I personally, I wanted to raise private money, but I did know the whole process. So I loaned money to somebody else that I trusted. That's how I actually did it. So I had $50,000 sitting in a bank account that literally made me $1 per month. The bank had the nerve, the nerve to pay me $12, $12. I'm not going to tell you the bank, but 12 bucks. So I took that money, I loaned it out on somebody's flip. They paid me $500 a month and I was hooked. I took that same story and I started telling it to other people. And then I combined that with telling them what I was doing. So I personally started out with family and friends. Now, not everybody will do that, but my first private money lender were, were my aunt and uncle. They're like my parents. And they are really serious about not losing money. So um, I've had their money my first apartment that's how i got into it was zero dollars out of my pocket they gave me 7500 bucks it was supposed to be 15 grand i don't even know why i asked them for 15 grand they were like i don't know about that they gave me 7500 i made it work they got 50 bucks a month 
that $50 a month they pay on their tab at the golf course. And that loan was only for a year. You know what they asked me? If you give us our money back, what are we going to do with it? I don't know. Why don't you just let me keep it? Two years later, still, same 50 bucks a month. I still have their 7,500 bucks and they're fine. So what I did, I took that story and the credibility from those people and I kept talking about it to people and talking about it to people. My dad, I told you, I'm not cheap. I'm fiscally responsible, but I thought my dad was cheap when I was younger. I still, I still think he's cheap. It's just not as big. My dad loaned me money on one of my deals. That's how I knew I was doing something with the stories because my dad does not like to give up money. I would send him this YouTube video because I'm, I'm going to put this on my YouTube. I'm going to send him this video just because because he'll totally resonate with what I'm saying. So that's how you build credibility. You just talk to people, but you have to be confident about the problem that you're solving for them. And that, right, so it all goes back to the same thing. Everything you heard me talk about today is solving a problem for somebody. I didn't realize that's what I was doing, by the way. So sub two was a huge help for me because it helped me gain confidence, how to talk to people and tell stories. The stories are where people resonate, not just, I mean, we can go to anybody and tell them, you can loan your money to me and you can tell them a story and tell them a story about what somebody else did. That's how you give them permission to give you money. Anybody else? Hello. Oh, we got two people. I didn't expect this many questions. So I have a, hey, Mason. Hey, I have a question, uh, but I also have a, a suggestion, something that I did to get over the fear of talking on the phone. Um, I was actually pitching to uh, short-term rental uh, arbitrage. And what I did was I called into areas that I didn't want to do, didn't want to have uh, a short-term rental. So like I was calling Kansas and little tiny pothole places and I would just work on my pitch that I wrote up. And that's how I got over my fear. Cause like I got cussed out. I got people like that doesn't make any sense, but now it's like, it's so easy for me to pick up the phone and call whoever. Um, and then another question from that is like, what happens if someone actually likes your idea and accepts it that happened on my first call? Um, because I practiced it for a month. Um, I just told him, Hey, I got to look at my numbers and, said it was not going to work out and uh, she still reaches out to me asking if I want to come out into the area and help out it's next to a university in Kansas but that's one thing I suggest to anyone that's nervous on the phone but my question um, I'm from Northern Virginia so there's plenty of opportunities for the midterm rental space even short term because there's so many uh, business professionals and uh, government contractors stuff like that that come in for months at a time to work but I was looking into it and they have a lot of uh, regulations that you have to live in the place for at least 51% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can rent it out the other time. So that's like people that are having secondary living places and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Is that something you just look into and say, hey, I don't want to even try and mess with that. Or is, have yep. you found something that you could nope. be a way to work with that? I don't want to work that hard. Okay. At all. I think we, you and I talked about one, was it in your neighborhood or one of those? We, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Okay. So, um, no, I don't want to work that hard. So this is why you need to know the restrictions up front, right? Are there some that you can, I don't want to say, I don't want to say get around, but this is why you have to know definitions and what they mean. I should have been a lawyer, to be honest, because I read everything with a fine tooth comb and I analyze the crap out of it. That's really how I started that argument with the people talking about Airbnb. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. I would find somewhere else that I don't have to have that as a roadblock personally. There's, there's too many other opportunities out here. It's like, it's the same thing as when you call a seller that's not motivated, but we're trying to convince, there's that word, convince them that they are motivated. Why? Just go find more people, five more people that are actually motivated where it's not that hard. Like I would never buy a sub two deal from a seller that's giving me a hard time because at some point we ought to be in a long-term relationship. I'm sorry. I know I, I can't do all that. If I want to build Lego sets and go to Disney, I cannot have that kind of stress in my life. So I would just find somewhere else. Great question. All right. Oh, yeah. I'm curious how you handle the screening with some of those companies. Like, obviously, I don't know if you can use rent prep for some of them or do you, because you said you work directly with a lot of companies, right? Mm -hmm. You can still screen the people. So you can still screen the guests if you want to. It's totally up to you. I do background checks because it's just part of my process. Um, and also, 
a lot of my places are in communities, so I want to make sure that I'm protecting the community, right? Because again, this is all about service. So I don't want a bunch of people that have this crazy background criminal record that's going to cause problems, et cetera. So the companies you vet, if they're a real company, you can find them online, right? Go research them. Ask them about their business. See what they do. Find out why they're coming to the area. How often do they come to the area? Um, that's the part of the business vetting. The people, you can individually background check if you want to, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys for letting me uh, stand up here and ramble for an hour, I think. Let's give it a round of